Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Arts Virtual Artist Talk with Diedrich Brackens. I'm Lauren O'Connell, Curator of Contemporary Art. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the original custodians of the land we are on today. They include the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, Hela River Indian Community, Akchin Indian Community, Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation, Pascua Yaqui Tribe, Tohono Odaham Nation, Piasid Odaham Nation, and the Hohokam people. Additionally, we would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the original custodians of the land where Diedrich photographed his work in Tohunga, California. They include Gabrielinho Tongva Nation, Kordananeño Pata Vian Band of Mission Indians, and the Keech Nation. Diedrich Brackens was born in Mejia, Texas, and currently lives and works in Los Angeles, California. Brackens received a Master's of Fine Arts from the California College of the Arts, San Francisco, and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of North Texas, Denton. The artist was recently announced as one of the United States Artist Fellows and is a recipient of the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Grant and the Marciano Artadia Award, the American Craft Council Emerging Artist Award, and the Studio Museum in Harlem's WEM Prize. We would like to thank the generous supporters of this exhibition, the S. Rex and Joan Lewis Foundation and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. I would also like to thank Jack Shaneman Gallery in New York and Various Small Fires Los Angeles Soul for their involvement in making this exhibition a reality. And of course, a big thanks to Smoka's team. While there are many things to go around, I want to thank Diedrich, most of all, for allowing me to bring this new body of work to audiences in Scottsdale, Phoenix, and elsewhere. He is a poetic, patient, and determined dreamer, and for that, I am grateful. Welcome, Diedrich. Hey. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we've been chatting a lot for many years now, and I think we've been talking a lot about how this whole exhibition came together. Back in 2017 was the first time we specifically spoke about working together in this way as curator and artist, but just to kind of acknowledge that we were in grad school together at the California College of the yes. Arts back in, what, 2012 to 2014? Yeah. Yeah? Feels like a long time ago. <laughs> long it was a long time, time ago. ago. Yeah. <laughs> and we've been on this journey individually, and we've made it here today to share this whole new series of work in Arc of Bull Rushes. Um, I'm wondering if maybe since originally when we talked in 2017, that was around the time that you were transitionally, transitioning from the abstract textiles and talking about including figures in your work. And here now, of course, you're very well known for your figurative weavings, but for this show, we also have other objects that imply the body. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's been such a, for me, what feels like a perfect stream of consciousness and everything is in its place. But um, I find for me that the body is always there or that is the concern that I'm always addressing, um, thinking specifically about my body, but thinking um, about um, trying to address other folks who sort of shared uh, similar perspectives and uh, positions in the world to myself. Um, so I think moving from um, those abstractions at that time into figuration was really for me this moment that I felt like I had to make um, myself, my blackness, my queerness a little bit more on the surface as opposed to embedded in the work. Um, and I think it was a response to, um, I think the political climate had sh finally shifted in a way that people were sort of out in the streets and talking about things and having experiences and sharing them with one another um, in a way that I felt like I wanted the textiles to be able to, to do that as well and not have to do a lot of the work of um, sort of getting people to peel back and look through and find 
um, these references that I was sort of burying under um, geometry, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, I think, this first moment of, of starting to kind of push the work forward and really privilege these bodies in a, a more figural way. I also remember that when we were talking, a lot of your early, earlier abstract works were talking about the violence towards um, black bodies, specifically young black men and um, queer men. Yeah. And you had works like the, the Band-Aid series with the rainbow colored blood. And when we talked, you were kind of at that point of being just really saddened by it all and looking to kind of turn towards this idea of healing and hope. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think those Band-Aids even at the time were this first space for me to sort of try to, to work out a lot of this violence and think about um, while holding space for it and, and grieving, it was also this moment to start to think about, about that healing, like thinking about cloth as this kind of intermediary that is that is really engaged in kind of protection and healing and uh, mending and these things. So, um, but, I, but I also was at this moment where I was like, it is so much, uh, so much labor involved in weaving and, and sitting with and dwelling in these ideas, uh, no matter what they are. And so I think I was at this moment of like, it demands so much of me to look at this information and then go and sit down and, and make these things that I was like, okay, I want to uh, make work that has maybe more of a holistic vision of the world as opposed to kind of zeroing in mm -hmm. on uh, these things that hurt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Well, I know we've talked a lot about weaving as a form of coming together and of healing the kind of tension required in it. Mm -hmm. And um, there was that poem about the sweet, sweet water grass and coming together and like, and I think one of your photographs for the show is called bring your water grass, water grass carefully prepared <laughs> or something. And that was, the, it, it's, it just reminded me of this idea of, of just like taking care of oneself, taking care of nature yeah. Communing with communities and also, you know, being outdoors and whatnot. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, I laughed because I was like, I don't know the title sometimes after I write it down. <laughs> so I was like, you tell me. Um, well, they're, they're very poetic too. So getting the words in the exact order is. Right, right, right. But, yeah. I, but I think that, that, like, getting the words in the right order, I think something about the, about the weaving of the baskets or the, um, the, the weavings themselves, there is for me this level of, of ritual or trying to refer mm -hmm. back to ritual. And I think even in that title, um, I was thinking a lot about um, what it means to manipulate materials and make an object and what those objects are for when they aren't um, explicitly functional, um, that there is for me this, try, this sense of trying to conjure or um, sort of make a spell of some sort, uh, at least for, for myself and for the viewer, that mm. you sit in this space for a little while and um, think about like what's possible there. How important do you think the titles are to your work? I think that the titles, uh, they often are the thing that, that comes last, but I think that the titles for me are, um, I like to believe they take up as much space as the object, um, and so I think I try to to dwell on them and think about how, um, like in a show uh, like this, mm -hmm. how they can sort of start to um, do a lot of the work of making meaning and um, helping people sort of jump from piece to piece and think about what's all um, kind of held there, especially because um, they don't really speak. Um, and if you don't, you know, you're not engaging with the, the wall text or these things, I would like for people to still have some kind of anchor to, to start to diagram what they're looking at. Well, and it's a further extension of your voice too, I would say. Absolutely. And I feel like poetry has also been a big topic of discussion in our conversations. Yeah. And I, I kind of found out that you're a secret writer. <laughs> 
Yes. So are you writing poetry? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I, so I try to write every day, mm. whether that's um, diaristic in tone or thinking about the work or um, just kind of parallel to the work. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, the kind of connection between um, the kind of mode or space that I'm in in my head when I weave and when I write are so in tandem so that if if I can't do one I can do the other and I think I get to access that same um, space in my mind where the sort of ideas start to take shape and um, I can sort of develop things and the the kind of links between weaving and writing um, like on a etymological level are so intertwined that for me it's like it's hard sometimes to even think about them as being separate mm -hmm. um although i have not like put a poem on the wall of, in an right. exhibition it, it right. is sort of like your titles um, are like poetry though yeah for, for sure, sure. Yeah. yeah what yes. else we just <laughs> simple answer to your original question um well maybe really fast, I was just thinking you keep talking about weaving, and I think there's the majority of the people watching probably do know about your practice, but for those who don't, maybe you could explain about your process with the loom and um, just kind of a quick overview. Yes. Not a quick, it's not quick. Master lesson in weaving, <laughs> no. right, right fast. <laughs> How you dye your cotton and yarn. Yeah. And um, so the the works here are all hand woven and hand dyed. Um, I work with um, pretty standard traditional floor looms um, and they I have three of them. They have names. Um, <laughs> and I really think about the, the work done there as collaborative between me and the machine and what it can and can't articulate. Um, but I start with the sketch. I blow that thing up to the scale of the work. So if it's um, eight foot square, I make an eight foot sketch and then I can go into that sketch and start to sort of redraw things or readdress them for what I know the loom is capable of. But I'd say the weaving then is like a uh, maybe two week to two month commitment of um, sitting there weaving uh, and then after that, I go back in and start to um, sew on the top or stitch things together or take things out um, until I get close to that thing that's in my mind. But I really, once I do get to weaving between the sketch and what I actually create, I think that there are moments of improving and like taking away and adding things as I go to kind of keep it feeling fresh because the process can get so kind of like tunnel vision that um, it's hard to not want to break with what you've kind of set out for yourself to keep it exciting. So then moving into basketry, like that's a completely different, a bit more physical process. Um, yeah, in some ways, I think it, uh, still employs a lot of the same um, rhythm, I think, um, and the over under and the kind of repetition of that same motion. Um, I think that there is, there's water and it's wet and um, sort of working in the round, but weaving is full body as well. Um, so for me, uh, it is just not having uh, the the loom there to kind of hold things for you. So it's right. like, I feel like I need two more arms when I'm making a basket than I have. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the shapes that you made with the arcs for the show? Yeah, so um, there is, I don't know, I know that they're not all in frame, but there is kind of like a, a shell of a, an arc, and that was really the original um, shape that I had set out to make. And I wanted it to sort of um, hold the body perfectly, kind of like a palm, I think. Um, and was looking a lot at 
um, small watercrafts, looking at a lot of um, things that you could easily recognize as a basket, um, even at that kind of uh, grand scale. Um, and I had been spending a lot of time with the Ark of Bulrushes, which is the name of the boat that um, Moses in the biblical story sort of is floated away in um, on the Nile River. On the Nile. Yeah. Um, and so I was really trying to find ways to point to this story um, without, but also leaving room for myself to um, insert my own narratives into it. Um, and then there's uh, Arc Indigo, I believe. Is the name Which of it. is behind you. Uh -huh. um, and it's, I was thinking then to start to make shapes that um, really lent themselves to the human form. So this idea of kind of being able to um, build up a, a kind of stand around oneself to kind of camouflage um, in a, a woven environment or in a, a river environment. So um, much like it's a photograph, mm -hmm. you can see that you're sort of in the banks of this river being kind of um, camouflaged by the surrounding reeds. Um, right, and the bass, the the arc in the photograph is actually unfinished. Right. With a lot of the strands coming out of the top. Yeah, yeah. And you're in a field of reeds. Yes, so. as the title. As the title says. <laughs> um, and then there's the um, cross arc, um, which again was really in, in its initial making for me about sort of holding the body perfectly, kind of fitting a piece of jewelry into a box and the, the jewelry being, being me. Um, <laughs> but it ended up needing to be a cross mm -hmm. just by virtue of how one might lay in it. Um, but I really kind of decided to fall into that shape um, to have a conversation with Christianity, which is um, it's so embedded in the, the title of the show and that original boat. Um, and I think for me, it's always grappling with how do I take this material and find myself in it? Like, how do I transform it? How can I um, think about how it relates to what's happening and what has happened? Mm -hmm. um, and I think as I was researching uh, for the show, there were all these ways that um, looking at the Mississippi River and thinking about how there's all these cities along that course, a river that have these Egyptian names and uh, thinking about um, how Harriet Tubman was called the Moses and how she was sort of this great liberator um, and just how we have in this country laid Christianity over everything um, was. Um, well, and I would say, especially you grew up predominantly in the South, along yeah. the, like in the Bible Belt area. So it was really ingrained into your culture growing up, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so I think it's, it's um, for better and worse, it is there. So yeah. it's like, it's such great material to, to engage with. Yeah. Well, since you bring up Harriet Tubman, maybe we should talk about the quilt patterns and the freedom quilts. Mm -hmm. um, in the in uh, this work is really inspired by a lot of different kind of patterning um, navigation systems. So we have the freedom quilts, but we also have the constellations, which are often referenced in the the coded patterns on the quilts. Yep. Um, and of course, the freedom quilts are n not, um, they're not recognized as part of history, but they are part of a culture. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can speak to that a little bit and how that fits into this. Yeah. Um, uh, well, so I have to preface by saying a lot of people would fight with you about it. I mean, that's, I'm trying to be as neutral history. as possible. No, no, I think you are, but I think that it's this thing that you, like I've told people, you know, there's a lot of uh, historical evidence that 
or there's a lot of historians have done work to say there's not enough historical evidence to say that um, en enslaved folks use quilts to navigate their way to freedom. Uh, but it's, I mean, people teach it in school, it's passed down uh, by word of mouth. And so a lot of people are like, no, this happened. Well, and we keep using the word myth around it. And myth doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't happen or that it right. did, but it, that it's like, part of this oral history right, right. that lives on yeah. to share a message. Exactly. And I think for me, that's where my interest lies. It's not about whether or not it happened, but it is that um, we have decided to tell a story that says um, that these folks, these Black folks who would largely have not been able to read and write were the arbiters of this language. Like they built a code or a, a way of seeing the world and sharing secrets with each other. Um, and to sort of think about what it means to then take up the mantle of making textiles now with that is kind of like a, a history to build on or a, um, a tradition to build on. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, then this is like, this is, uh, a liberatory practice. There is a way to kind of embed messaging and share stories here. Um, and that's like, that's the thing that I think people really like love about it and what I want to like explore and explode. Um, so for these weavings, what I did was take some of those quilt patterns and then uh, weave them into these textiles. And I use patterns um, that have been thought to have had s specific significances um, and then also patterns that um, I could sort of tie to particular constellations. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, there is a pattern called flying geese that I tie to a, a constellation of a swan. Um, there is a pattern called bear paw that I tie to Ursa Major or the Big Dipper. Um, and then there is uh, the North Star, which is the, the one that's right behind us. Um, so I was really interested in sort of overlapping these two systems of navigation um, over top of one another and thinking about um, how I could insert these, these bodies and figures um, into conversation with um, these wayfinding patterns. So then within these um, mixture of the constellation and quilt patterns, you have the black body and figure silhouetted. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk about like, how do you come to determine what the positioning of the body is for it? Um, and I know you talked a bit about like mimicking some of the constellation animals, but I feel like there's a longer process to it than just that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think some of the the gestures are intuitive, or I know that I want a, the figure to project a particular kind of energy, or um, convey a sense of power, or um, uh, a mood of some sort. Yeah. Um, so I think often if there are pairs, I know that I want them to. Um, to sort of dance together. That's not like the best way to get at what I, I want to say, I guess, but it's, um, there is something about that communion between them that's important to me um, and how they maybe support one another or um, hold the weight of another. Um, and then I think it is about still thinking about how these particular weavings are about uh, finding one's way to something. So having this figure sort of erupting um, from the center of that star, um, thinking about how the figure that is in a labyrinth is really kind of dancing. So this kind of movement kind of through and the, that flow, I think was really important to me. Um, it's also interesting when you have two figures in a weaving, the way that they overlap and connect. Yeah. Um, the kind of intimacy that's there. Yeah, and I think especially in 
because they're all rendered in silhouette, there are these ways that they start to um, become one body or the suggestion that, um, that it is this kind of union between these two figures to become this like one thing. So in all of the kind of conversation and writing that we've done so far, we've talked a lot about these histories and the black body and the stories and the patterns. But, um, you know, I, I think earlier I asked, is there, you know, a lot of your work has addressed um, queerness. And so do you feel like this work embodies that as well? Yes. <laughs> Next question. No, I'm joking. Um, I know. I was like, I don't need the answer to that. But. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to, there are a lot of ways I feel like I could just use like a weaving metaphor here, but I do think that there are a lot of ways for me that it's hard to pull on one strand and not pull on all of them. Like when I think about, because I think I get questions like about where the blackness or where the queerness or where these like specific markers of, uh, my identity or the things I'm trying to say show up, but I'm kind of like, I can't find the separation often, yeah. right? Um, but I think in in the case of um, Through the Summer Triangle, which is the one here, um, for me, it really was taking that um, iconic triangular shape that shows up in a lot of quilt patterns. Um, but in this case, I was using to reference the, the flying geese quilt pattern and motif, um, it also starts to have an echo of the kind of pink triangle. Um, so I think for me, there are ways that that kind of gets at thinking about queerness um, of a, a, a particular kind of historical moment. Mm -hmm. um, where else can I say it is? Well, I mean, in many ways too, I, I feel like we haven't talked about one of the works in the show so far, and that's, um, Oh gosh, I wanted to call it the word we've been using, um, the reasoning beast, uh -huh. which is behind me and off camera, so you can't see it, unfortunately, but it's a, a figure holding the back of a goat, basically flying through the night sky or a mm -hmm. dark blue sky. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, in some ways, a self-portrait mm -hmm. and a very personal tie. So just that same idea, like how are they these ideas of identity and being separate, they, they can't be separated. Right, right, So right. maybe you could tell us a little bit about this, like, pull towards the astrological sign and the, the significant, significance of that for you. Yeah. Um, I think my decision to include this thing that was referencing astrology so specifically, so specifically was to think about um, that the show, I think kind of at its core, one of the things it's attempting to engage with is wayfinding and, mm -hmm. and mapping and um, finding one's way. And I think uh, in the moment we live in and in the like context that we kind of travel in, there's so much, um, identifying who we are and who we are in relationship to others through astrology. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like yeah. I can't go a week without having had several conversations about like right. how, like, of course you would do such and such thing <laughs> because you are of uh, this star sign or, you know, like, you know, all of these things. So I think for me, it was like, oh, this is this very kind of um, contemporary way to think about wayfinding mm -hmm. that's internal. Um, and I think something that also has these links to much older histories that you know we can't seem to as people uh, let go and that we love and that we think offers us something and shows us something. Um, so I really wanted to find a way to kind of um, have an escape ladder from like mm -hmm. what everything else in the show was saying, mm -hmm. but still kind of deal in these same ideas. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, when you talk, uh, you were talking about your work earlier today and you were talking about one idea being like the kernel and then kind of opening up that kernel and making it, unfolding it to be so much more than mm -hmm. what we perceive it to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of, when I look at your work, I also think of 
the way that we talk about time with your work and this mixture of like history with present day histories mm -hmm. with this idea of the future. Um, it seems as though this work is really not of one time or of one space, but kind of incorporating many places and many times. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think sometimes for me, the, the process of figuring out what the work is going to look like takes so long because I have a tendency to try not to include anything in an image that could place it in time. Mm. So, um, but the problem I often find is that the tendency for the viewer is to see the past um, mm. because I don't include things that would. It's would easier make to you look at about, the past, though, than, yeah. you know, um, you but do I, that all the time. Yeah, but I think in this attempt, maybe to make them timeless or whatever, for me, it is more about. Um, if someone finds them hopefully in 20 years or 200 years that they would still resonate and they're the things that you could pick out that um, would still hopefully exist. I mean, maybe goats won't exist in 200 years, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I doubt that a cell phone would either or a car, or, you know, right. these other things. So I think I'm, I'm trying to find these vehicles that, um, are legible, I guess. Um, it, it's interesting, too, because one thing that persists is nature in many ways. I mean, for mm -hmm. as long as it will stay with us right now. Right, right, right. But um, so this idea of the figure, you know, it's a silhouette. It's not dressed in any sort of clothing. But then actually with the photographs that you've taken mm -hmm. um, out in nature, in the water in the forest with the baskets and your body in that space. You you do have clothes on in, in them, um, but this kind of like, I don't, I don't want to say return to nature because that seems so corny, but this kind of like bringing oneself into these places and yeah. blending in with them or not even blending in, but like becoming Part of it. Right. I think um, black folks have been so in the contemporary and popular imagination divorced from nature. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the violence that was visited upon folks there historically. Um, I mean, even if I think about the sort of recent past of of green books or like having to know where you're going before you go and where you're going to stop and having to have backup things in case something bad happens. Like I think uh, there's so much anxiety about being in the, in, a, in the rural world, like even telling people, you know, that I'm from the South and these things or that, you know, my family lives in this small town. People are like, I'm sure you're glad you got out of there. But I'm like, actually I had like very, pleasant and positive memories and associations with this space. Um, and I want to take up space there and I want to feel like I can and it's safe. <laughs> um, and I think that there is there are a lot of black folks who still live in these places in the world. And I, I think that's something that the work is thinking about. Um, and I uh, think like queer folks and uh, folks who were enslaved, like this, what these were places where one could be oneself or one could find their way to a, a better place. Um, so that there, there are for me this this tie to nature as a space that um, does help one get to another place and in and of, in and of itself, like offer something um, free, free from the societal like. Right, right, right. And I think so many people know that and experience yeah. that. And I, I think for me, it's I am so looking forward to having a world where like everyone gets a, a piece of that while, while we have it, as we've wow. been saying. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. What is the habit we talked about yet? Um, what habit we talked about? 
So. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the film that we made for the exhibition and that process? Sure. The um, film that was, it's filmed and directed by Christian Bruno and Natalia Bikic. Be uh, Be mm -hmm. Apologies. I think that that last one was right. <laughs> I, think, I think it was too. So for that process, Christian and Natalia came into your studio how was that having people like filming you and in your studio during this time? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was amazing. Like they were super professional and it was great to see my, mentally it was like, oh, I feel like I'm seeing myself being seen <laughs> and being the word we haven't said this whole time in, during the pandemic, like mm -hmm. to have other people be around. Um, was a, a challenge in certain ways, but also uh, grounding in other ways, of course. Yeah. Uh, but to have uh, this presence there at every moment of this process, making the baskets, making the photographs, making the weavings, um, I think it gave me a lot of perspective about what I was doing and gave me time to really think about how, how they fit together. Um, and I mean, I'm excited to see what what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and it was the first moment that I started to talk about the work to other folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it started to just kind of crystallize that this was happening and um, there was something to look forward to in these endless days. Um, and it was a new experience of thinking about what an exhibition is and how it's packaged and uh, what the story is that will be presented to the viewer in the end. It's interesting, this whole, the whole experience of putting together an exhibition during the pandemic has changed all of our perspectives of how we share work with an audience. Right. Um, not just the writing on the wall and the artwork in the gallery, but uh, virtual artist talks, which yeah. is all new to me in terms of doing it. I've attended many of them. Mm -hmm but also then producing these films that in many ways are, are actually very helpful for an audience to understand the process and mm -hmm. kind of an expansion on what the exhibition is about. But it also allows people to stay home and watch the film and look at the installation images and hear right. you speak about the work. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's changed everything in terms of our engagement with art these days. Yeah, and I, I think it was this time, this exhibition and the making of it and all of that is, um, I've been learning a lot. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that I've really started to, to consider a lot is what the difference between what I know about the work mm -hmm. and what I want from the work and what I want the viewer to know and want from the work and I think before this, I, I was thinking about those things as, as, as one thing, and yeah. now I'm kind of like, I don't know that they need to know, you know, this little detail or that detail, but I want to know what, what sort of experiences folks start to have in conversation with the work in one room. Um, and I think it's, it's I've become a viewer of the work again. Like I came in after it was all installed and I was like, I don't even know that I made this. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, and it feels, it's a wonderful feeling to start to, to look at the objects again and know that there is, um, there's so much to unpack and think about for, for even myself. Um, so I hope that folks get to have that experience too. Well, should we open it up to questions in two minutes? Or... Yes. Okay. <laughs> two minutes of silence. <laughs> Both of ours? Yeah, no, just his. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know yours too. Mm -hmm. um, I my sun sign is Capricorn. My Moon is Gemini and my rising is Virgo. I feel like I shouldn't give this information out. It's like I know. 
Thank like you. a social security number or something. It is. It's very personal. <laughs> Don't know these people. <laughs> but that's what it is. Yeah. We do talk about astrology a lot. We do. Lauren's a Leo. Thanks for sharing. She's holding back right now. I'm holding back. <laughs> Oh my God, uh, Sprechen, <sighs> Anansi, and um, Yvette. Don't know why I'm pausing, I do know them. Absolutely. Um, so here, James Marshall and Kara Walker definitely uh, figure in the work and in inspiration and people who have inspired me. Um, and I think um, I would go back even further to say Aaron Douglas um, is maybe one of the first artists that I knew of and focused in on when I was in undergrad. So I think the silhouette for me has been this thing that I've had an intense interest in and thinking about the ways it can be a vehicle for um, the subconscious and all of these things are reasons that I kind of return back to that well over and over and over. Okay. Oh, yes. Can you tell, can you share why you present both the fronts and the backs of your work? Is that right? Yeah. Um, weaving to me is so sculptural, like the process of making uh, one of these weavings, it requires my whole body and there's a lot of kind of up and down collapsing and expanding of the yarn through every point of the process. Um, but once you cut it off the loom, it sort of um, by default becomes two-dimensional in a way that I know is not quite true about it. Um, and I think presenting them in space feels like it almost re reignites the loom. So putting them in these kind of wooden structures really um, lends itself to um, the way in which it was made. And it being, does reference the loom. Yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I love that. And getting to see both sides, I think, illuminates some of the process stuff that happens uh, for and people. And the backs are equally beautiful. Yeah, and I like love the surprises backs. here and there. They do strange, strange things. <laughs> um, and I think even if people don't know exactly how I made them, you get to start to. Um, into it some of the process stuff that's happening um, by being able to see the back. I'm sorry, Julie. When you feel blocked. Oh, when you feel artistically blocked, uh -huh. what do you do to help you move forward? Oof. Um, <laughs> I would imagine, I'm imagining I do a lot of what other people do. Some of that is just stress and stress and stress <laughs> until um, I get up, go for walks. Um, I love going to out into a park near my home. Um, I read a lot of poetry in particular. There are um, books in, in specific that I return to. Um, so I think that there are like kind of my... Do you want to tell us what some of those books are? Yeah, so Ceremonies by Essex Hemphill is kind of like that touchstone thing that I always kind of come back to and look at again and again and again. Um, and I think it has so much... Uh, it's been a guidepost for me just in my actual life, mm -hmm. but in the, the messaging that I want the work to have. Um, yeah, and I think I, I love history and wanting to 
not weave, I was going to say weave, but integrate that <laughs> into the work. So I think I'm always like, okay, I need to look back at these kind of historical things and figure out how they kind of collapse on things that I'm thinking yeah. about right now. Yeah. Can you say more about the protected? Protective nature of the works. Can you say more about the protective nature of the works? Um, what can I say about that? I would say that. I think they might be talking about, in, like when you talked about indigo, the kind of taller basket and this idea of it protecting the body, mm -hmm. possibly. Um, what can I say about that? I think I like the idea that um, it is possible as a maker of textiles and, and maybe what I want to inspire in other folks is that um, just within ourselves and with my hands and some sticks if and some string, if I break it down, break it down to the base level, um, there's this capacity to make a tool or an object um, that can offer you safety or peace or warmth or um, a kind of wide range of things that I don't think we think about and that we um, have become sort of divorced to. Uh, and so I think that's something maybe that I'm trying to get a, a, around the kind of protective uh, possibilities of, of the objects that they, they could do all of these things, that there is this possibility embedded in, in craft and well, skill. I think also at one point we were talking, you had mentioned to me that part of it is to like imbue agency to handicraft makers, that it is within your ability to make and yeah. empower yourself and absolutely create boats and blankets, as you said, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how more of Mejia influenced your work? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so a lot of, I wouldn't say necessarily the works here um, in, a, in the one-to-one -one way, um, but I have made works that engaged with uh, events that happened in my hometown. Uh, I have really focused in for a while on a body of water that was that is there with the same name, so Lake Mejia, um, and making work just thinking about that space and visiting it and um, collecting water from it to dye the yarn. So there was this way that I was really kind of um, intensely looking at this this space for a while. But I think. Um, there are these kind of things that I've inherited on a kind of internal level from my family and from being from the South, from being from Texas. Um, there is this kind of uh, mythic nature to telling a story, to like em embodying yourself yeah, you were in the talking world. About storytelling yeah. in the South, it's just like you grew up knowing how to do it. Yes, yeah, and I think for me, the way the kind of aesthetics of the work and all of these things come from sort of being in that space, looking at things and like loving it and wanting to kind of um, regurgitate it mm -hmm. in some ways. And, and I mean, I think I have times where I'm like, of course, this is the, the aesthetic decision you're going to make, but like, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> another one to make instead. Mm -hmm. I got the That's first a long one. Can you repeat it then? Do I think about um, the viewer's body in relation to the textile? Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I think one of the, the uh, basic ways I do think about that is trying to keep the works 
um, at a kind of domestic scale so that they do reference uh, maybe standing in front of a curtained window or the size of kind of almost a, a queen size coverlet um, so that when you stand in front of them, they are kind of at the scale of textiles you're familiar with already. Um, and they, I think the bodies are pretty close to full size. So as you're um, standing there and they're right at the space where when you look at them, you're you know looking at a head. Um, that it starts to be almost like a mirror or um, that kind of conversational thing happens. Um, yeah, so I feel like I want people to look at them and get a sense for um, like their own beating heart when they're standing there as, as they like look at fabric and cloth. And um, When we had one of our early conversations too, back in 2017, you were actually talking very much like about bringing the figure into the work, but also how do you bring the viewer's body into the work? Mm -hmm. And I know um, for the works that were are that are in Darling Divine, mm -hmm. that was originally originated at the New Museum and is currently at the Blanton. Yeah. Um, you have several mirrored stars on some of the works. Is is do you feel like that is part of bringing the body back into it as well? I think so. Yeah, and I. I even though the works can't be touched, I like that they offer themselves, like they, they beg almost for people mm -hmm. to touch them with the color and having reflective things. Mm -hmm. And I think especially on the stand, seeing them kind of they sway, yeah. like they kind of exhale, I think. So there's something about them. That, um, I think on the technical or physical material levels keep people really kind of looking and kind of searching across the surfaces of, of them for these like strings and knots and ruptures and um, yeah, hope that answers that. Last question. Is there a specific inspiration behind the color palettes that you use? Okay, I did hear that one. Is there inspiration for the specific color palettes that you use for each piece? Yes. <laughs> um, I think in this uh, kind of concert of weavings, um, I decided to have, uh, there's two layers of fabric. So there's the kind of base layer um, of uh, kind of gray and black. And then there is the secondary layer um, that in all of these is many different colors. Um, but I wanted to invoke a little bit of this idea of the, the night sky by using this kind of black and charcoal uh, palette. And then with the secondary color in a lot of these, um, I think it was intuitive. I, I, like there are things that maybe come to mind um, in a moment that I'm like, okay, I wanna make this one do this or make that one do that. But in three of them, I just made it easy on myself. And it was red, blue, and yellow uh, as the kind of base colors. Um, and then it becomes this dance of color theory, thinking about what the, the seam color needs to be or what color I might need to add to. Uh, right, you mentioned the push and pull. The push and pull of the layers and pulling and, you know, making the yellow pop or mm -hmm. pushing back something so that um, the figure jumps forward or um, having these moments where things blur between foreground and background. Um, so I think it is art school. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just uh, intuition on some levels. Well, it's interesting too, because you talk about we talked about color palettes and you're like, I do tend to start with the primary colors, but when we think about primary colors, we think about really saturated mm -hmm, yellow, mm -hmm, saturated mm -hmm. red, saturated blue. But when you dye the, the yarn, the way that it happens, it doesn't necessarily hold the, the color in very saturated ways. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they're not necessarily true primary. Right, 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 yeah. And so I think a lot of the playing and tinkering and adding other things is to sort of counteract that or uh, embrace it or like push it a little further into that kind of dusty, yeah. hushed 
muted place. And you do tend to, you, the bodies are always with typically acrylic yarn so that you can have that really black, black mm -hmm. or really vibrant color that they're depicted in, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they almost like suck the light into them. And I, I love what that does. It's um, a nice contrast to it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I want to mention that we do have a virtual opening tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Please join us if you will. You can find out more information at our website, website smoka.org. And one more time, thank you, Diedrich, for being here. Thank you, thank you.